Good morning. Good to see everybody on this pretty morning. I invite you now to stand. It's so good to have you here. Let's begin our time of worship together by hearing God's call to us to come close to him and see him as he truly is. Let's read this responsibly. It's from based on Psalm 98. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nation. He remembers his steadfast love and faithfulness. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. For the Lord has made known his salvation. Let's pray. Father, we, we really want to give you all the worth that you deserve this morning. In your great mercy, you have given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. You tell us that Jesus' death is the death of death and that his resurrection is the resurrection of all things. And so now we live forgiven and beloved because of all you have done for us. And you tell us that one day everything's sad will come untrue and things broken will be made new lord we long for that day yet in the meantime we want to be thankful and thank you because of the resurrection that we are no longer enslaved to our sin and therefore we are no longer afraid to live or afraid to die we remember this morning your love and faithfulness and so lord we say we adore you and we thank you and now we pray the prayer that your son taught us to pray saying together our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen well, as we remain standing, we're going to take a look at 
an Old Testament passage from Ezekiel. Ezekiel was a prophet of God to his people, to God's people, about the 6th century B.C., so 500-plus years before Jesus came. And he was a prophet to the God's people who were exiled, these people that had lost just about all hope. They thought they were dried up and that um, individually and as a nation they had lost hope. And he spoke this word. He took, he took Ezekiel, God took Ezekiel to a, a, a valley filled with dry bones, dead bones, and he told him to speak and to prophesy. And he asked him the question, can these bones live? And here's the passage. Let's give attention to God's word. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. And then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Amen. Please be seated. So we come to a time to confess our sins. We come before this giver of life, he who only has the power to give life. He's created us. He's created us also and given us new life spiritually uh, through his son. And so We come to him and he wants us to confess and to admit what is true about us, that we constantly turn from him and look to our own resources, but that we're made to live with him and in him. And so we want to come clean and be restored and renewed and cleansed. And so we do this weekly. I'm going to read this call to confession, then we'll have an opportunity to confess together, and then we'll have some time to confess silently. So I invite you to use the kneelers if you're so inclined and willing. And we will read from 1 John, God's call. I will read this. Let's hear God's word. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Together we pray, Almighty God, who raised from the dead our Lord Jesus, we acknowledge that we are unworthy of your redeeming grace. We have not believed your promises or trusted in your risen Lord. Through the worldliness of our spirits, our eyes have not seen his presence with us. Through disappointments and sadness, our hearts have not heard his word. We have not trusted in his redeeming power and have been overcome by evil. We have forgotten the good news of his victory over death and have not known the things that give us your peace. But now in repentance, we come to you asking for your forgiveness. Mercifully grant us pardon from all our sins and restore to us the joy of your salvation. For Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Lord, hear us now as we bring to you our silent and individual prayers of confession. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you now to stand, hear God's assurance of pardon. We do this each week to remind ourselves it's by God's grace we've been saved, not by works, anything we bring to the table. It's all by his power. He's the one who's made our dry bones come together and breathe life into us. And once you have that life, the Bible teaches, and this passage teaches, that when we're dead, he's the one who can make us alive again. And when you become alive again through Jesus, you never lose that. You never lose that. So know that. Let's hear God's assurance of pardon from Ephesians chapter 2. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, 
even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's sing as a response to this good news, the doxology. may be seated. Ask the McCollum family to come forward. The baptism of little Gwendolyn Adele. We've talked about this. It's going to be a few years before she can say that name. Um, so Georgiana as well, Ian and Jamie here. Such a privilege to be have them with us this morning and to do what we're about to do um, in conjunction with, that fam with this family. Just a, a couple words on baptism. So um, baptism is a seal of and a sign of God's covenant promises to his people. It's, you know, we still do this today. We, we will uh, seal a promise, an important promise. We'll, we'll seal a covenant today. We do that with marriage. And to seal marriage, for those of you who are married, most of us have not taken tattoos. We've taken a wedding ring, right? And that reminds us of the promises that we made. Well, that's what baptism does. Baptism is a sign of God's faithfulness to this family. When Peter talks about baptism in Acts 2, and this is after his, he's just preached at Pentecost, and um, the crowd is, yeah, is stirred, and they say, what shall we do? He says, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this promise is for you, and for your children, and for all who are far off. So the promise is for the McCollums, and that promise is for their children. Baptism is not the promise. The promise of forgiveness of sins, the promise of the receptivity of the receiving of the Holy Spirit, it is a sign of that promise. And just as the promise is for little Gwendolyn, so does the sign belong to her as well this morning. And so she comes for baptism and it also locks us into this family as well. We have a responsibility as her church family to assist these parents so that Gwendolyn one day, as she grows up, will take hold of the promises of Jesus Christ for her, that covenant of grace by faith. Here is the promise that Gwendolyn is not her own, but that she belongs, body and soul, to her faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. So Jamie and Ian, I'd ask you now these vows that you'll make on her behalf, standing in as you do for her. Do you acknowledge Gwendolyn's need of the cleansing blood of the Jesus Christ and the renewing grace of the Holy Spirit, do you? Do you claim God's covenant promises on her behalf? And do you look in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ for her salvation as you do your own, do you? Do you now unreservedly dedicate Gwendolyn to God and promise in humble reliance upon his divine grace that you will endeavor to set before her a godly example, that you will pray with and for her, that you will teach her the doctrines of our holy religion and that you will strive by all the means of God's appointment to bring her up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, do you? Now, church family, the promises that you make to this family as well, do you as a congregation undertake the responsibility of assisting Ian and Jamie and the Christian nurture of little Gwendolyn, do you? Amen. Gwendolyn, I checked the water and it's not warm. See how this goes. Ian and Jamie, will you name your child? Gwendolyn Adele McCollum, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. May the Lord bless you and keep you. 
May he make his face to shine up on you and be gracious to you. May you know the Lord's favor. And may he give you his peace. Some of us come into the kingdom kicking and screaming, right? That's right. Yeah, we do. Well, brothers and sisters, would you sing to this family now as we welcome little Gwendolyn, a member of the covenant of grace in our church? Let's sing. I invite you now to turn with me as we turn our attention and with some of the things on our hearts, the joys and the sorrows, and we lift them up to God. I'm going to lift up the ones that came to my mind, but God is God, so talk to him silently, if you don't mind, <laughs> um, while I lead us in a, in a prayer. Let's pray together. Father, we, we just sang that song, and it, it, you are so faithful. You're always right. You're always good. We don't always sense that or feel that, but it just it just shows itself over time, all, always. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your love for this family, for Ian and Jamie and for Gwendolyn. We pray for little Gwendolyn to, to know you at an early age. You bless her, use her to love others well. Let her know your love for her. Give Ian and Jamie, just what they need to, to be her parents. Father, we also want to thank you for the gift of new life of uh, little Ian Lewis Peak to Caroline and John this past week. And bless uh, mother and child and, and father, and uh, bless them, Lord, and their family. Father, we um, think of new life. We just look outside and see all the different colors, and it's just uh, a small little sample of the truth that you you bring restoration you make old things new again we thank you for that we thank you for that so much lord lord we want to lift up to you just different folks that are on our hearts different um people that we love and care for and we ask you to be close to them as we know you are lord we pray for christy hamilton with the recent loss of her father be with christy and her family Father, we pray for Chathan McCundon, that you be with him and his family, the recent loss of his father. And Father, we ask you to watch over Laura Blomberg, the recent loss of her, her mother, Florence. Be with her, Lord. Father, we thank you um, for um, our friends and different folks that are going through hard things. I want to think of just and pray for Chuck Cochran this morning, who's undergoing surgery from his hip after a bike accident you would be with the surgeons and restore his body lord we pray others lord that come to our mind we we lift up to you now we pray for irene and for jim for shelly for cheryl for sue for jane for loretta for eric for jim father we're mindful that tomorrow is um, the covenant school moves back into this building and that is not an easy task for so many of the teachers and students and administrators. We pray that your blessings would be on them, that you would give them healing and comfort and safety. Bless them, Lord. 
Father, we are so thankful for our, the Nashville program, Nashville Fellows program in our city. And we ask that you watch over these 13 young men and women as they end up their, their Nashville Fellows program in May and look to the future that you would use um, just even the skills and the, the, the thoughts and the, the, the classes they took this year and, and use those in their lives, Lord, to help them fall more and more in love with you and with the people you bring in their lives. Father, we turn our attention and we ask you to bless Steve and Amy Robertson uh, as we partner with them and as they're missionaries to Central and South America. We pray for wisdom and strength as they plant churches and um, help teach in universities and seminary and you'd watch over them and, and the gospel would be um, proclaimed through both Amy and Steve. And lastly, Lord, we thank you for, the, for how you asked Ezekiel to, to preach the word and bring new life through your word. And we ask that you would do the same to our dry bones, that you would give us hope this morning where we're lacking hope, that you are ever mindful of us and caring for us. Thank you for Chad and his family. and Bless them, Lord, and bless us. Give us soft hearts, teachable hearts this morning. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this month, if you didn't know it, April month is a, a month that we, we chose to focus on stewardship and and big word for just the idea that God's making us more like him is if you're a Christian God's spirit is changing and forming you and God's a giver and he's made and he wants us to give and when we give we learn uh, the kind of the upside down world of, G of God that we actually get so much when we give and he, God, God never lets us out give him and so in stewardship month we're talking about we're, we're thinking about and challenging each other like God's given me some talents, not just my, my pocketbook, my checkbook, but he's given me resources and time, and I, I'm individually made, and he's, I've got something to give, and what is that I have to give, and, and is, is there something in this church that I could use my gifts and um, serve others? And so we're focusing on that, and we're having individuals come forward, and this morning Dave Glass is going to come forward and bring us a little report of how God's um, used him and his blessings in stewardship. Good morning, my name is Dave Glass and um, I've been asked to share a little bit this morning. Um, during April, we consider stewardship and how we can participate in the life of our church by giving our time, our talents, and our treasures. <clears throat> it's not just about donating money, although that is an important part, but Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians that the church is a body made up of, of all the parts that we would recognize and that it cannot function properly without each one working together. I consider myself a pinky toe. Maybe not as glamorous as other body parts, but if you've ever injured your toe, you understand the pain the whole body suffers when it's not doing the task for which it was designed. The rest of the body will not function very well. If the little things are not taken care of, our church will suffer overall. There are so many small tasks in the church that need people to help with so that the organization can serve the Lord, run smoothly, meet the needs of our growing family, and be a light to our community. I have been blessed in many ways when I have served by ushering, greeting, cleaning up after coffee, serving at gatherings, making meals, helping with ministries, and so many other toe tasks. The people I have worked alongside have become my closest relationships and friends. Most of these tasks do not take very much time or effort, but are vital to our church. When you pray about stewardship, please consider how you can help with your time and your talents. We are offering resources like Jim Barnes' Spiritual Gifts, uh, uh, spiritual gifts Assessment uh, to help you figure out where your strengths and passions are. Do not wait. Start small, start soon. We need you, whatever body part you are. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Pinky toe. Awesome. Um, well, welcome. It's good to have everybody here. It's good to be together. And um, thank you for joining us this morning. I hope you're, you feel warmly welcome and 
um, encounter Jesus here. And I want to encourage you to pass the paths on the end of the pews. It should be on one side or the other and just this one little way to recognize the folks on our, on our row and just acknowledge them. Um, and just so we can get to know each other even better. And other ways to get to know and be a part of the community and grow and share our gifts, whether it's like what Dave was mentioning or just um, uh, serving or just enjoying and being in fellowship with each other. There's lots of different things in the back of your bulletin, so I encourage you to check that out at some point and take that home perhaps and get involved. We'd love to get to know one another better. Um, also, one, one big announcement this morning. Today is national, uh, not national, it's Nashville <laughs> Fellows Program Day. It could be national, I don't know. Um, but the fellows program may be something you haven't heard about before. The fellows program, um, it does go, around, it is across the country, but in Nashville, um, we are celebrating, uh, we have uh, all of our fellows here this morning. What the program is, it's, a, it's like a, a study and a, a discipleship and work opportunity where college grads, recent college grads come to a city, they live with a host family, they take theological classes, um, taught by the churches that they are hosted by, and they work a job that they've been training for, and they're trying to incorporate the gospel into every facet of their life. And it's really, it's really a stretch, as you know, when you've changed new surroundings. So they just come in here fresh, and they serve. And, um, and we are so fortunate. It's, it, we have, there's three churches in Nashville that, that host this. It's Covenant, West End, and St. George's. And this morning we have the privilege of having all 13 with us. We, there's each, each church has um, a, a number that work for them and serve their church particularly, but they, they do a lot of classes and they get to know each other. But the four that have served us um, are, are Becca and Paige and Drew and Hunter, and we're so thankful for them. And their work in the children's ministry and the youth ministry. And I know the other churches that they were here would say the same about the the other fellows that I didn't mention by name. But I do want to recognize them and for us to see them. So if you're one of the fellows, I want to be one of the fellows. If you could stand right now and let us see you and just recognize you, there they are. So well done. That's awesome. You can be seated. We're so thankful for you. I know the host families, it's been such a treat to have you. Um, and we want to pray, just continue to pray for them. And I think their program concludes in May and they move on to other things and hopefully take all what they've learned here. So we're great to have you all here this, with us this morning. Um, and now we continue our worship by re reminding ourselves that some of the resources we've given, God wants us to share those resources and to be part of his kingdom work. And so I invite you as the ushers come forward just to, to trust God with your resources and to, and to and to be a part of his kingdom work. And um, we will listen to the choir sing as the ushers come to collect our gifts.
welcome again. Glad that you're here with us uh, this morning. Really, it's a privilege to stand up and be with y'all. So, um, if you have a Bible, you can turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 20, beginning in verse 19. If you don't have one, you'll find one in your, your pews, or you, the, we, we have the, the, um, the scripture passage we'll be studying there in your order of worship. So, beginning in verse 19 of John 20, we are continuing our study through John's Gospel. These are the final two chapters. I guess we've been in and out of John's Gospel now for two years almost, and we are coming to the conclusion. The last two chapters are all encounters with the resurrected Jesus. Encounter after encounter after encounter. I want to give you the setting for this particular passage. It is Sunday evening. I would say it's Easter evening, but they didn't know what that word meant. It's Sunday evening, the day of the first, the day of the resurrection. There was not multiple resurrections. Um, uh, the most of Jesus' core group. So it started off at twelve. Um, most of that core group is here in this room. It's the twelve disciples minus Thomas. We'll meet him next week, and minus Judas. And they're gathered in a locked room for fear of their lives. And in the setting, Jesus appears to them in that room. And what's really interesting about the setting itself is that the last time this group was together, the last time this particular group was together, was also in a room. It was, you may know, the night of Jesus' arrest. And they were in the upper room, the upper room of a house. And John spends a lot of time in that room. John chapters 13 through 17, it's five chapters. And if you remember back to that room, if you remember that kind of setting in John, Jesus does a lot of work there. He, it actually starts by him washing the disciples' feet. Um, they celebrate the Passover together. And then Jesus gives them his final instructions, what he wants them to know. But many of those final instructions aren't doing. Most of them are, are really promises. And so in that other room, he said things like this. He said, I will not leave you as orphans. Um, I will come to you again. The world will see me no more, but you'll see me again. And he said, look, you'll have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one at that point will take that joy from you. And he said things like, my peace I leave you, my peace I give to you. In that other room, he said, I will ask the Father, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, the Holy Spirit. He that is, the Spirit will dwell with you, and He will dwell inside of you. That's just a quick sample. Jesus said all of that and more in that other room, and that was like four days ago, according to this, kind of where we are in the story. And now we're in another room, and if you listen closely to these five verses, what you will hear is Jesus honoring or fulfilling the promises that He made in that first room. That was the room of promises made. This is now the room of promises kept. And just to be clear, over the course of those four days, the disciples have done absolutely nothing to deserve those promises. Uh, they've been a mess in terms of their own faith. But here is Jesus once again coming and loving them anyway. He's doing what he said he would do. He is providing for them out of his own faithfulness for the very faithfulness that they lack. For our young disciples, just a couple questions for you this morning. Um, so all these, a lot of these like, post-resurrection stories, that they, they, they highlight one emotion that the disciples feel before they see Jesus, and this one's fear. So just a couple questions for your young disciples. Why are the disciples afraid? Um, what makes them no longer scared? And then finally, what does that teach us about our own fears? If you're able, would you stand for the reading of God's Word this morning? From John chapter 20, beginning in verse 19, just through verse 23. John writes, On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them, again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. 
we pray for us this morning. Father, we, um, we thank you for this portion of your word given to us through your servant, John, and we, we pray that, that, that um, you would attend to our hearts by your spirit. Um, Father, that you would drive out fear in us. And we pray, Father, for the courage and boldness that so often marked the early church after they could say, we saw Jesus. Um, would you fill us? Would you make us more like him? We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Um, th this is a, th this happens a lot in John, but this is kind of a show and tell passage. Um, so Jesus is going to show him something, then he's going to tell him about that. So we're going to look at those two things in that order this morning. He shows the disciples something, then he tells them something, and in both the kind of the showing and the telling on that first Easter evening, we learn something about what the resurrection means for us where we sit this morning. So show and tell. Let's look first at what Jesus shows them. And if you look closely with me at your, and through your text, you'll, you'll see that in verses 19 through 20. So just put your eyes there for a moment. Again, just to kind of retell the story, that the, the doors are locked, we know, at least, at least for security reasons. And then we know that Jesus somehow comes into that room. We don't know why, why or excuse me, we know why. We don't know how. But the point at, um, at this point, and maybe the function of this above all else in John's gospel, is that Jesus comes into that room when it's locked as a miracle. It's a miraculous entry. So, so he comes in and he stands among the disciples and he pronounces his peace. And at that point, John does not record a response from the men in that room. It, it, it seems like they don't really recognize him at first. In fact, it's not until Jesus shows them his hands and his side, his wounds, that John says they saw him. They were glad when they saw the Lord. So I want to just pause here for a moment, and I want to think about together the resurrected Jesus, and specifically about his body. And we'll get to why that's important here just in, in a few minutes, but I just want to add things up. What we know so far from John's account, his gospel, what can we say so far about what John has told us regarding the resurrected body of Jesus. First, we know first of all, and John was very clear on this, that his body was not in the tomb. So earlier that morning, on Sunday morning, three days after he died, the body of Jesus was not where everyone else thought it would be. That is significant for all the gospel writers that on that first Easter morning, the body of Jesus was emphatically not in the grave that was marked for him. It's not there. Number two, when Jesus first appears to his disciples, they don't recognize him. It, it, it's strange, but it, it's a pattern throughout the Gospels. Mary didn't recognize him, if you remember that from our passage last week. These disciples don't recognize him at first. If we want to add in Luke's account, the two, the two guys who are walking with him on the road to Emmaus, they don't recognize him. So there is something that is notably unfamiliar about the resurrected body of Jesus, there's something different. He walks into locked rooms. That's not normal. It's different. So on one level, we could say that, that, that his new body, the new body of Jesus is different, and it's different in a way, as John tells us, that is not limited in the ways that a normal body experiences limits. Yet we know it's a real body. Remember last week, Mary, Jesus had to say, don't, don't cling to me anymore. She hugged him. She stayed around him, and he said, now let me go. So there's something very new, something otherworldly now about the resurrected body of Jesus. Third, the newness of his body, whatever it is, that newness is still connected with his old body, the old body he had before he died. And, and that is really important. I mean, think about it. Mary still recognizes Jesus' voice when he calls her by name. The disciples recognize his wounds, his old wounds that are very much still a part of this new body. So whatever it is about the body of Jesus, whatever it is that is otherworldly and unfamiliar about it, what we can say is that the new has not erased who he was. It has not canceled out the body he had before the resurrection. 
No longer in the grave, new and unfamiliar in some level, the old still present and the new. Now, why is that all important? Let me give you two reasons. First, um, if you've been around this church for a while, you know that we use the word gospel a lot. We talk a lot about the gospel. Sometimes we don't summarize it very well. We don't explain it, but um, let me do that. There's a lot of ways. There's a lot of ways to summarize the gospel, but here's one way to do it. The gospel is the body of Jesus. The gospel is the body of Jesus. The good news of what God has done for us is not just shown or made visible in his body like a parable. The good news is his actual body. His body, the body of Jesus Christ, is the substance of our faith. The wounded hands, the wounded side that somehow also passes through grave clothes and through locked doors, that body, if you are a Christian, is your hope. The Lamb of God that was slain, the Lion of Judah victorious, that's the gospel. So that to believe in Jesus Christ, as John has been very clear he wants us to do, to believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is not just to believe in concepts or ideas about sin and forgiveness and grace that float around somewhere in the ether. It is to believe in the actual body of Jesus Christ given for you. His body is the gospel. Second, his body is your future if you trust him. The way Paul talks about it, he, when he talks about the resurrection in, in 1 Corinthians 15, another, another really early writing, by the way, post-resurrection, when he talks about that, he talks about the, the body of Jesus as the pattern or the first fruits of the harvest that is to come. You know what that harvest is? It's you. And that means that what, what Jesus' body is, is it is the end of history, the end of your history, right here given to you in the middle of history. You say, what in the world does that mean? Well, let's just go through our bullet points again. His body was no longer in the grave. One day, your body will no longer be in the grave. And I'm not just talking about your soul. I'm talking about your body. The full you that God made as a body-soul nexus is you. Wherever they plant you when you die, that plot of land is a rental. It is a lease. It is an interim. Because one day at the end of history, no one will be able to locate you in the grave that you were laid in. Second, his body was new, and one day your body will be new too. Like his, in ways that are totally baffling to how you experience now. Just like the body of Jesus. Totally different, totally new in some ways. The constraints and limits that mark your body right now in the old creation, they will no longer apply. Your body will be otherworldly. The way Paul puts it is this way. He says your body will be a heavenly body. When you read that in 1 Corinthians 15, that does not mean an immaterial body. Paul goes on to say that it just means that while right now you bear the image of the first Adam, the man of dust, of history, you will bear the image of Jesus, the man of heaven. Does that mean you'll be 21 forever? Uh, does that mean that you'll have the abs you've always been? Does it mean no wrinkles? Does it mean your hair will grow back? Absolutely. I, I don't know. I'm just kidding. I, <laughs> I, I don't I have zero idea. Um, it, you won't care about those things. What it means is what Paul says in Romans 8, the sufferings, listen to this, the sufferings of this present time, including the, the sufferings that your body bears, the sufferings of this present time that we carry in our bodies are not worth even comparing to the glory that awaits Jesus consuming things or consummating things for us, the glory to be revealed in us. The future glory of what awaits your body is an unworthy comparison even to what you want right now. He is the pattern of that new body. Third, Jesus was still himself, and you will still be you. And that means the you of right now, the you of this morning, the you of the present, will not be erased or forgotten or canceled. You will be the fulfillment of what God has always meant you to be. You will be more beautiful. You will be more free. 
You will be more royal than you've ever been, but you will still be you. And that fullness that God will restore in you will take into account the wounds that you bear right now. It will take into account the work that you are doing right now. It will take into account the entirety of the life in all of its ordinary things that you are offering up to God presently at this moment, just like in the body of Jesus. The life that Jesus lived before the resurrection mattered. The life that you live in him before your resurrection will matter as well. This is the pattern throughout the Bible. God is always shaping the new from the He restores, he fulfills. He doesn't wipe the chalkboard clean and start all over. The resurrection of Jesus, guess what? It didn't undo his incarnation. The new covenant didn't undo the old covenant. Fulfilled it. Um, the old creation will not be erased by the new creation. The promise in the body of Jesus is that God does not make all new things. He makes all things new, including you. So right now where you sit, your life matters for the new creation, for what is to come. Your work matters, your body matters. This is why we are unapologetically in every way pro-life, because God is the author of life, and it all matters to him. And the good work that God is doing in you even now in your life, he promises to bring it to his fulfillment healed restored forgiven but not erased or forgotten it is really the story of the two rooms in john it is promises made and then one day promises that will be kept that's the show our, our faith is a bodily faith it is a bodily hope it is a bodily love and now the tell verses 21 through 23 let's look there briefly verses 21 through 23 what does jesus tell his disciples and before we do that, I just want to respect the sequence of the passage. Um, by the time Jesus really tells or commissions or summons his disciples to do anything, he has already at this point restored them by the show of his body. So by the time he tells them something, they were already glad when they saw the Lord. Their fear has been replaced by joy. And just to take note, that joy is not rooted in the fact that their circumstances have changed at all. Nothing's changed for them. I mean, really, persecution, the threat, the threat of harm and suffering is still there. That joy now is rooted in the wounded, resurrected Jesus standing with them. They are convinced that if he is with them, if that body is their future, then what should they fear? Then it's from this place of confidence that Jesus tells them what to do next in verse 21. And verse 21 really is the summary. Look there with me. Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, Here's what we do. So I am sending you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. The church is a sent organization. That is the job. And these disciples who at this point in the story represent the church are to take the work that Jesus has done for them and they are to carry forward that work in the world. And that work is not only, but it is primarily what we read about there in verse 23, just to be clear. The mission of the church, or the sentness of the church, is to offer the wounded, risen Jesus to the world such that the forgiveness of sins is declared to those who believe in him. And the warning of judgment is declared to those who do not. And that is our job, is our fundamental mission, you may not know this, but really churches don't get to make, make up their mission. We, we don't get to just change our mission based on our culture or context or something else that might seem easier or more fun or less threatening or less painful. The mission is the gospel that is declared the peace of God with sinners through Jesus Christ from his body. That's the job. Now I want us to step back for a moment. We'll end here. I just want you to look at the passage again and consider what you read, probably read over, the context 
of the work to which Jesus is summoning us. And I want you to look specifically at the grace and the privilege of that work itself. Go back to verse 21. This bleeds into verse 22. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And when Jesus said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. So what we have here is we, we have this work, right? We're supposed to go and do what he has given us, what he's called us to do in the world. We have this work. But what is the context of that work? What is the context in which we are to go and declare the gospel? Like who's involved in it? Like are we just doing the thing that Jesus has summoned us to do? Are we rolling up our sleeves and getting ourselves pumped up and charging the hill and mustering all the courage we can? You know, maybe there's some of that. But I don't want you to stop and think how Jesus lays this out for us. Who is involved in the work? Jesus mentions first the Father. This is God the Father who sins. It is the same Father whom John has already told us, Jesus has told us rather, who so loved the world that he sent his Son. It is the same Father who would not withhold his greatest treasure, but who gave the Prince of Heaven in love to reconcile the world to himself. There is the Father. And there is the Son. There is Jesus, the one who is bodily present here with his disciples, who in obedience to the love of the Father has loved us, as he has said, to the end. Our crucified and resurrected Lord, who still bears in his own body our wounds. And then there is the Holy Spirit. That same Spirit who brooded over creation at the beginning of time. The same Spirit through whom God spoke initially to give order and life to the world. The same Spirit whom God breathed out in Genesis 2-7 to raise up that man of dust, Adam, in order to fulfill or to do God's work in the world. There's the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So what is the context of the work we're called to do? The context is fellowship with God. The triune God. It is in union with God the Father and God the Son and God the Spirit. We are brought into the life of the Trinity, into the fullness of God, and into the work of God, His work, for the sake of a new creation. So here are these like 10 guys, and they are locked in a room. And five minutes ago in this story, they were cowering and trembling in absolute fear of what the future holds. And now Jesus is breathing into them the life of the new Adam so that they will be raised from the dust to go and do what God has now made them to do as new creations. I don't know if you know this, but there's a, there's a golf tournament going on right now. Do y'all know that? A little bit. Small tournament, maybe you've heard of it. It's the Masters, just a few hours from here, southeast in Augusta, Georgia. And in the Scruggs household, our, our home, um, this, is, this is one of our, I think I can speak for our family here, one of our favorite sporting events of the year. And if you don't know what the Masters is, it's a golf tournament. It takes place over four days, and it's beautiful. And inevitably, when we s spend time watching this tournament, at some point, every year, one of us will say, can you imagine playing it? Can you imagine what it would be like to play there? I mean, it is, it is beautiful just to look at on the TV screen. For those of you who have been, and this has been unanimous in my experience, I've never been, never seen it. Um, for those of you who have been, what I've heard unanimously is that what you see on TV absolutely does not do uh, the course and the setting justice. And my kids like golf, and I like golf, and, you know, we, we love to play. We're not very good, but we, we just will sit and say, hey, can you imagine what it would be like to play the course? Um, we play McCabe a lot, our local public course down the road. And I can tell you this, that whether we were playing at McCabe, which has seen a lot of golf from our family, or we were playing Augusta, the work of golf is the same work. Tee up a ball, you hit a driver, 
You hope to be hitting an iron. You hope your next shot is a putt. And you do that over and over and over again. It is the same work. But the opportunity to play in the glory of Augusta, in the glory of that context, in the beauty of that setting, it would make that work, it would make the doing of that work feel very differently. It would be an overwhelming honor and privilege. I would just be pinching myself saying, I cannot believe that I'm here. In fact, a few of us were on staff this week talking about Augusta and um, one of our staff members basically said, look, I'm not good enough to play that course. And if someone, if someone ever asked me to play, I would have to tell them no. And Billy Barnes, I don't know if you're, he immediately started laughing and said, no, you wouldn't. You would not turn down that invitation. That is an invitation, no matter how ill-equipped you feel, you do not turn it down. The new heavens and the new earth are better than Augusta. We have the privilege of doing that work, of taking the gospel to the world in full fellowship and in full communion with the Godhead. We are involved in the glory of the new creation in ways that we can't even now fully appreciate, and we will enjoy it one day face to face with, his, with Jesus, with his resurrected body, with our resurrected bodies, in a fully glorified and resurrected cosmos. We should be pitching ourselves, pitching ourselves, because here we are, ordinary people who've been brought into and made members of the glory of God, and now we are included in his fellowship and in his work. This is a labor, but it is a glad and joyful and privileged labor. May we do it with full hearts, because that is exactly what Jesus has raised us up to do. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word to us this morning. And Father, we do pray that, um, Lord, that you would, uh, you would cause us to see you, to know you, to love you more. And Father, that the rejoicing that you promised to those disciples when they saw those promises fulfilled and their hearts became glad because they saw you and you were enough, you were sufficient. Lord, we pray that that same joy would be restored in our own hearts and that you would send us out, send us out as agents of your new creation to proclaim the gospel of your body, the wounded Savior who is now raised to life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you now to stand with me and Let's read responsibly the great thanksgiving is found on page 12, your order of worship, as we prepare to take Lord's Supper together. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks unto our Lord God. It is right to give you thanks and praise. It is right and good and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks unto you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, everlasting God. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Please be seated. So we come to the table. This is Jesus' table. He set it for us. It's the table, as Chad just told us about. It's, it, it, it symbolizes and represents promises made, promises kept. It's to call our attention. He wants us to remember who he is and what he's done for us and who we are in re response to that. And so as we eat and we drink, we remember what he's done for us what he is doing for us and what he promises. I, it's just so good news to hear about our futures and that our lives right now matter. And this food right here, this meal is to remind you you're loved and you're cared for and you're looked after and it's to strengthen you. Your life matters 
and what in this going forward this week this is to strengthen you and give you food for the journey and remind you that you are his and he's with you and so we partake of this together and I invite you to come and take this meal and be strengthened um, by our Lord this is a meal this is as I mentioned this is Jesus' table it's not a uh, covenant's table and so the only criteria for this is that you love the Lord and you see him as the only way truth and life if that's um, if Jesus is the key and you're a member of a church in good standing this meal's for you if it's not we're so glad you're here and I pray you can can still consider as we sing all the truth claims and you've heard preach of, of what Jesus is saying and you would you would come to know him and ask him for help and guidance and you can still come forward or little ones can still come forward that um, and, and, and receive a, a blessing from our, uh, our elders just let us know by crossing yourself if you could let's pray as we and get ready to take the meal together Lord we thank you that you love us we thank you that you are concerned about us that you are always for us that you are strengthening us and you're ever present help us to see as we just heard just the glory of what we are about that we are with you you're with us and um and that we are saved and that you um you love us so and pray this meal would uh, we'd honor you and we'd also uh, be blessed by it in Christ's name amen Scripture tells us on the night that our Savior was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is given for you. Take and eat. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins for many. Drink of it, all of you. For as often as you eat this bread or drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take these and remember that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith and drink remembering that Jesus willfully and gladly gave his life, gave, spilled his blood for you. It's our practice to come forward for communion. The ushers will dismiss you. If you're not able to come forward, please let them know or wave at Chad and me. We will be happy to come serve you. Um, <laughs> and, um, and I want you to come forward when the ushers and also let you know that there's uh, gluten-free bread and there's wine in, in the, in the um, trays except for the outer room is grape juice. Uh, ushers and elders, come forward now, please, and let's enjoy the Lord's Supper together.
So with thankfulness and faith we rise to 
Sisters, you are raised with him. You are now sent by him to do his work in the world. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Let us go out and serve the world and our city as those who love our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said together, thanks be to God. Amen. Go in peace. Amen.